Good morning, Chicago and the rest of the world. Welcome to the Money, Sex, Gen X podcast. This is season five, Big Stu. Uh-huh. Season uh-huh. five, episode number five. Wow. Should you start a not-for-profit? How you doing, fam? I'm well, brother. Glad to be live and direct. Glad to be in here, man. Excited for this conversation. That's what's happening with me, man. How you feeling, man? I'm good. I'm good, man. I'm ready to have this conversation. I want to welcome you all. I am your host with the most, the man with the plan, the Scotty Pimpton, uh, the podcast Pimpton. Come through. And I am never alone. As I say in every episode, I'm joined by the titan of Team Tech. Uh-huh. A dope cat who curates dope people. Uh-huh. The Kanye of the stock trade. My homie. My yeah. friend. Yeah. My brother. My co-host, yeah. Big Stu. Bo, 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 bo. Lick a shot. Lick a shot. What's happening, people? Man, we glad to be back. It's been a while. We're back to serve you with some more life game. If you like what MSG is doing, please like, comment, share. We'd love for you to drop MSG100 in the, sh- in the chat to let us know you're out there. You might not want to participate in the convo as far as putting comments, but drop MSG100 so we know you're out there. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Hey, Stu, our YouTube channel is doing pretty good on yeah, terms I of saw. organic views. You saw that? I saw that. I saw that. So you all keep subscribing and helping us grow. Uh, Big Stu, do we got some merch to let the people know about? Yeah, let me share. Let me share the screen. We do have some merch, and I know we're gonna drop. We're gonna be dropping some new stuff, but there's no reason to drop any bunch of new stuff right now because y'all need still need to cop this stuff. This is the uh, mental health therapy. No, this is the therapy edition. Who can I trust right. with my stuff? Okay. You know, this is the uh, celibacy uh, edition. What Soul a great episode. Ties. Yeah, 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 yeah. Soul Ties Left Unchecked is equal to an STD. <laughs> yeah, Man, yeah. That, you had to be yeah. there to get that. Yeah, that was a good one. You want to say that something was a about dope that? Episode. Yeah. Great episode. Great episode. Um, you're only selfish to people. Who can't get their way with you? You know that was uh You remember what episode that was? I don't. Which one was that? I, I don't, think that I was. I think remember. that was also the therapy episode. Okay. I think that was a therapy episode. That sounds familiar. There goes my favorite mug. You drink mm-hmm. my coffee in. All right. My favorite throw throw blanket that okay. I let I let nobody use my throw blanket. You know, it's it's for aesthetics only. This is a healthy me. eating shirt. That's the one I still want to. That's the one I want I right that. there. Yeah, I have that one. Ease into eating better. Yep. We got our champion piece, you champion product. Yes, we do. You know, I'm rocking. I'm no, I'm not rocking the baseball tee, but I am rocking the branded logo. You need your gator for your. You know, you should still mask up. Book bags, sleep. What are these called? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Your lady, one of your young ladies out there. Your lady, ninety. Your ninety. Your ninety. There you go. Yeah, your ninety. Okay. We got jogging, it's, uh, leggings. You know, boy shorts or you know underwear for the men. Socks, tank tops. There's no reason why y'all shouldn't be repping the brand out here. No doubt. So, I like the gray hoodie. Yeah, it's nice. Yeah, too. that's okay. a good. One. That's a good. And yeah. that's a champion as well. I have the. I have that one in gray. And I have this zip up jacket as well. Yeah, that's nice that too. One, so. Support the movement and get some MSG merch. Get some merch, yo. Get some merch. All right. So that's what we got on that, man. Cool. All right. So with, today we're dropping some life game. Today, Big Stu, around this conversation. And I kind of got this episode idea from you. I don't remember which one it was, but you were making a comment about, and we're about to bring on some really, really solid guests that I can't wait for you all to meet. But Stu, in one of our episodes, you were saying that you had some strong views about starting a not-for-profit versus a for-profit. I don't want to spill it again yet. I want you to get into it with our guests. 
Okay. Do you remember that episode? Absolutely. I still remember stand that on that comment. Yeah, I stand on it 100. percent I remember. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. So let, let's bring our guests on. I want to introduce you all to them. All right. Here we, we go. We have Bridget Scarborough and Felicia yeah. Young. Welcome to the show, Money Sex. Right. Now, before I introduce you, ladies, I just want to tell the people why I wanted to do this episode. Um, partially from Stu's comment in a previous episode, I personally got my start doing not for profit. Um, they gave me the framework to actually learn how to do other types of businesses. My first one was in Inglewood. We did a program called Ladies Alive um, at a high school in Inglewood. And from there, I was with uh, Beulah McLeod, Ladies Alive. And the, the structure of that was to just kind of teach etiquette and to take those young ladies throughout the city of Chicago. But that was my first entrepreneurship, I call it entrepreneurship venture, first not-for-profit for sure. Now, I've gotten a chance to work with both of you all over the years. Uh, I'm gonna intro, let me tell you a little bit about Bridget first. Bridget, I'm gonna tell them the, little, the corporate bio, then you can tell people a little bit more about yourself. Bridget is the founder and CEO of 501c3.org. It's dedicated to helping people realize their vision of starting a not-for-profit. We know a lot of people want to start not-for-profits. 501c3.org is there to assist people in that vision. 25 years of experience. She's uh, Bridget's done a lot of different types of businesses from home daycare. She had a toy store. Uh, her and I actually had an educational consulting company years ago that we have a lot to talk about with that. She has a master's degree in early childhood education from DePaul University. Um, she also was in the financial industry for a while, for a little while. She's a Chicago native, lived in Texas for how many years? Six years, I think? Five. Five years she lived in San Antonio, and now she is here with us today. Bridget, did I miss anything? What else can you tell the people about yourself? Well, I just want to say, um, in addition to what you've named, um, I just really have a passion for helping people start businesses and not-for-profits. Um, my, my specialty niche is um, not-for-profits because I have so much experience in it, but I just really have a passion for making sure that people are able to realize their dreams, make money um, doing what they love to do, Okay. And um, <clears throat> even before I got into this business, this was something that I always did for people that I knew. And eventually, when the pandemic came around, I realized that um, when a lot more people um, started going um, toward realizing their vision, that I had a lot of exper expertise that I can share with people. So people started calling me um, with advice and um, or just expressing their problems and I had the answer to it. And so okay. it made me realize that, you know, this expertise was something that people really needed and maybe I should start a business and really focus on that. Okay. We're going to get deeper into that. So thank you for joining the show. Now we, I want to introduce you to a friend of mine, Felicia Slayton Young. And don't forgive me if I get the name of the financial advisory company. You might have to correct me. Bell LaCour. What's the correct pronunciation? Luker. Bell Luker. Okay. Bell Luker. Alicia is definitely a financial advisor, been in the game for many years. She decided to start her own financial advisory firm, Bell Luker. She is also a founding member and executive director of the Greater Inglewood Chamber of Commerce and the GE Chamber Foundation, which I want to hear more about the foundation. Um, both of those organizations, you all, they have a mission to transfer, transform Greater Inglewood into a popular commercial and retail destination by advising, developing, and showcasing the established businesses in Greater Inglewood. She's also, and I didn't know this until you said the bio, but you're now also a board member of the St. Bernard Hospital and Health Center. I didn't know that. And that, their mission calls for us to care for the sick and promote the health of the residents in the community while witnessing the Christian values of respect, dignity, caring, and compassion. 
Now, I will share that the Greater Inglewood Chamber of Commerce, Felicia and I found it together. So we have a lot to tell you about that. I think I had a little bit of a hand in the Chamber Foundation. I, I got to recall, jog my memory. But Felicia, did I miss anything? What's up? Tell the people a little bit more. Hello, hello, everybody. No, absolutely. You helped us, you know, start the, the Chamber of Commerce and the foundation. Um, and it's been great, you know, working with you at that time to build that. Doing a lot of work. I can't wait to get into this subject because, you know, it's 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 a lot of passion. It's nonprofit is just like any other business, right? The people who started are focused and they have a passion and they have a mission and they want to see it, you know, through to success. But there's also some interesting hurdles, especially in the nonprofit space. And so navigating that, learning that, especially me coming from a corporate background, not realizing all of these potholes that could be in this space and learning to navigate that. And I'm still learning. Right. So this is going to yeah. be a fun, this is going to be a fun topic. <laughs> okay. So let's get into it. Big Stu. We, uh, most of the episodes, we do something called actual factual. Uh, yeah. Usually before we start getting into our experiences and our opinions, we try to drop a few facts to frame the conversation. So we're talking about not-for-profits. So according to our research, there are almost 2 million tax-exempt organizations in the United States. Mm. Um, the not-for-profit sector, 10% of the American, it constitutes 10% of the American workforce. Didn't know that. I probably would have thought it was a little bit higher than that, uh, mm. which equals 11.4 million jobs. They say that Americans are generous according to our research, total charitable giving, is around three hundred and ninety billion per year. Wow, billion would it be? Billion, three hundred and ninety wow. billion. Uh, approximately okay. sixty-three million Americans, which is twenty-five percent of the adult population, volunteer their time, mm. food, talents, and energy, mm. to making a difference. And the last one I'll give is there's three most common types of not-for-profits according to our research. Um, number one is religious organizations three is educational mm -hmm. and third is foundations and grant making organizations mm -hmm. okay so that's kind of what's going on in the not-for-profit space then i also did a little bit of research that suggested that many not-for-profits are struggling right now which i don't think is a surprise particularly from what they say uh those started by black founders okay so i would like to talk about that a little bit but Stu, first yeah. The comment that you made in the previous episode was pretty heavy about your perspective about whether people should start not for profit. Can you let the people know about that comment? Yeah, before I get to that comment, I also just want to acknowledge I just had a conversation yesterday explaining to someone that Chicago Public Schools is a nonprofit. Chicago Public Schools is a nonprofit entity. Definitely. May not be a 501c3. Then I had to go into that 501c3 is a tax code de designation. It's there are many different nonprofit tax. It all depends. There's so many. So a lot of people have a lot of misconceptions about nonprofits. And here's my thing. And Felicia, I think you started to allude to it. And I don't understand why so many black folks rush to start nonprofits. And I'm I'm putting a little sauce on it. I'm I'm saucing it up a little bit. I'm I'm being dramatic a little bit. I don't understand why so many black folks be first business they want to start want to be a nonprofit. What? I disagree. To your point, Felicia, a nonprofit is a business. Lots of black folks need to be worried about ownership. Mm. Own something first, build that, then get into your philan philanthropic efforts. That's my perspective. That's my two. Okay. Seconds. I'm philanthropic. I'm I'm on the board for a few nonprofits, a couple of nonprofits. But my first addict is not a nonprofit. I need to own. I think that's the comment you were talking about, right, E Money? It is, man. So I are you telling that. the are you telling our young I'm strong viewers, with that? Are you basically telling our young viewers that if you got to choose between starting a not-for-profit and a for-profit, it's definitely for-profit? Definitely for-profit. All day, every day, for-profit. 
Not Bridget, just non, not not and look, not just nonprofits hurting E. All huh? businesses hurting. Yeah. Okay. All businesses are hurting. Okay. So if I'm gonna hurt, I'm gonna hurt with me trying to look for the upside of the profit of it. Okay. All right. <clears throat> hey. I, I know now I see Brit. I, I see Brit. Wait. Now you got two not for profit heavyweights here, so I want y'all to push back. Bridget, what's up? What you got to say about that? Well, well, actually, I do not disagree necessarily with what he's saying in terms of own something first. I think actually that would be a great if everything was to work in the proper way. Um, that would probably be um, what I would suggest is to own something first. However, there is a lot, like we're talking about the youth. Um, the youth have a lot of concerns about things that are going on in the world. And so sometimes what drives them, especially when you're young, you may not have a lot of financial concerns. So what's driving you really is a mission. You know, you want to solve a problem. You want to um, make a change in the world. And for young people, that is actually the time that they should be thinking about that before they have children and, you know, have all these big responsibilities. So a not-for-profit may be actually a good avenue for a student or a young person that doesn't have those responsibilities, have a lot of time on their hands and can organize. Um, and they can still, and we all know that you can still make money with not-for-profits because non-profit does not mean no profit. What it means is that you, you are not organized to make a profit. You're organized for some type of charitable purpose. Um, but that does not mean you cannot have a salary. That does not mean you can't acquire property through the organization. You can do so many things that businesses, um, you know, that you can do under a regular mm -hmm. business. And it actually could be easier because you're not working with your own funds. So you don't have to wait until you earn enough money to do those things. You can use donations. Um, you can use grant money. You know, so it opens up a lot of opportunity. It's another avenue. It's not the only avenue, but it's definitely something I wouldn't shut down. Felicia, thank you for that. Felicia, what do you have to say? I'm particularly interested in the financial piece as you are a financial advisor. I want to hear your general opinion, but from a financial perspective, do you think it's better for someone to start with a not-for-profit or for-profit? Definitely a for-profit. I, I okay. get, you know, I'm going to go back to what Big Stu just said. A non-profit is not, uh, or, or a 501c3, let, let, let me be particular, is not a business model. It's a tax code. And I think people confuse the two all the time about how this works, right? They hear, oh, the, this you know nonprofit got this donation and this much money. It's a tax code. Don't get it confused. But I think for it, with any business model is the opportunity to expand each arm of the organization. So I say get deep into your business model, understand what it is that you want to do, still understanding that there's a giving part of you that you want to expand and, and expound upon. But that's the opportunity to branch into the nonprofit space. And maybe there's a, you know, if, if you're running, if you're selling skateboards, right, and, and you see, you know, all of the work you're doing and all of the profits you're making and you, you know that you want to give back, then now start a foundation arm of that business that allows you to do more impactful work, right? One, yeah. it solidifies your business and it allows your business as a tax break to give to your Here own. Here we go. Here we go. Here we right? go. It's about thinking through how we're going to use these funds that really make sense, allow you to still do the passion work that you want to do on the giving yeah. side of it. And then tap into the grants and all of those that you can tap to tap into on your foundation side to really do that giving work that you want to do. But you got to think Felicia. through it. Yeah, you got to think through it. Big Stu said that actually that the yeah. foundation comment he actually said that in the previous episode. Also, my co-host be giving it up. So yes, yeah, uh, we agree I, I, obviously with yeah. that. Yes. I think my challenge, and, and this is the big, bigger piece, Bridget and Felicia, 
I was just finding that I was coming across too many people to your point, Felicia, who just didn't don't even understand what it is. And they just see it as a free fall. I'm going to go get this free money. I literally have heard people say, I'm going to go get this free money. And it really speaks to how and I'm just going to talk about us. I'm black. So I'm going to talk about us and be critical of us black folks. You know, just I'm looking for the easy way to the bag and see from their perspective the you know a lot of that operating a nonprofit seems must be easier because people just give you money you know you have a mission and that's like that's not it that's not it so that's absolutely true um that's why like with my company 501c3 my org when i take on a client there's a whole education piece that i do because a lot of clients come into the door thinking that it's going to be easy and thinking that they don't need a plan, that they can just get a 501c3. They don't even know what the 501c3 is. They don't know what the responsibilities of a 501c3 is. There's a lot of responsibilities that come with a 501c3. They're not thinking about the board. They're not thinking about exactly. the mission. Right. Those are the people that I'm talking to about. Right. No. And that's and that's part of the reason why I did this, because I started this organization or sorry, this company, because this is an actual company. Not a, so not so a wait, 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 <laughs> wait, wait. Let's get this right. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. 501c3 my org is a for profit. It's a for profit. Thank you. That's what I'm yes. talking about. <laughs> yes. And and what I do is I educate people about how to do this the correct way and what they're getting into. So I talk about the benefits, but not only the benefits, also the responsibilities. And I, I feel like I wouldn't be much of a consultant if I didn't give them that broad picture, because I could easily just say, okay, I'll give, you know, I can fill out the application for you and give you a 501c3. That's the easy part. But maintaining it and knowing what you're getting into, I, I feel obligated to make sure that my clients understand the whole picture and have that proper education going in. Yeah. Imani, Imani, yeah. I'm sorry, I got it. Here is Stu's moment of transparency. Let's now, go. I there's wait. another side of my conversation. You know, it's two sides to everything. So yeah. I'm going to, hey, ladies, when there's Stu's moment of transparency, is when I kind of put my own self, I, I, I lay my own self on the table. It's like, I'm going to be vulnerable, right? Another thing, another thing, my issue with nonprofits is, and it's not an issue with nonprofits. It's actually my challenge, right, with nonprofits. I think that it is far more difficult to promote the mission, the purpose and mission of a nonprofit than a for-profit. Mm. I think it is harder so one of the reasons I've avoided it, because I actually see it as more difficult to run a successful nonprofit than run a successful for-profit. And okay. here's you got to get people to buy into the mission and give up this money, right? For your for your purpose. And and you have to constantly, constantly, constantly promote that. And that is very, very hard work. So Bridget, to your point, you can give anybody the, the, the status, the 501c3 status, but they got to go fundraise and get people to dig into their pockets and give them the money. I fear that. I think it is so much easier. <laughs> we're talking about levels of ease to do it in a for profit setting than to do it in a non profit setting. So I fear that. And that's my moment of transparency. Two moment of transparency. Okay, so it's harder in your eyes. Now, that, I, now I want you harder. to be transparent about this for the people. Have you actually started a not-for-profit organization yourself? I've attempted to start a 501c3 once. Before. Okay. Okay. And then right. I said, I will have to do this when I have two things, more time and more money. More time and more money. Okay. So he got some credibility. He's done the for-profit. He's tried to start a not-for-profit. And that's what I want to segue into. What, let's talk to the people about what really goes into starting a not-for-profit organization. Stu talked about the difficulty. Uh, Felicia and Bridget have kind of mentioned some points about, yes, you're solving a problem. It's, you, know, you need a lot of different pieces to make it work. 
what goes into it? Felicia, how would you go about the process now being seasoned? How do you approach not for profits now versus how you did when you were younger? That's, I think that's a good question. Um, it, there's a lot of credibility to what Ixtu just laid out there for, for us. Um, the reality is nonprofits in any form is still a business. And just like starting the business, it's about having capital to start, right? And so right. I really want to walk into this saying that, yeah, you as a nonprofit, you can figure out how to find the money, but that's where the work is, right? Especially when you are a startup with nothing, right? You're basically funding it from your own pocket. And we, we did that with the Chamber of Commerce, right? We funded it yeah. from our own pocket. And, and found ways to, one, show our value as an organization by making sure that we were walking in our mission, right? We weren't just telling people what the mission was, but we were, you know, I was going door to door. I was going into businesses. I was walking on the corridor. I was participating in the community events. I was trying to really get clear. But that didn't necessarily bring the money right away. Right? right. And so the challenge really is that whether it's a for profit or nonprofit, everything is easier if you have a bucket of money to help you out, to get you started <laughs> on the path. Bucket of money. You need that. You need yeah, that. Right. You know. You know. Yeah. And it goes back to what Big still said about, you know, how do you get people to believe in your mission? And I ain't right. going to lie from the sister girl right here is it, the reality is Chicago is clickish. Mm. Nonprofit space is clickish. All right. And it's about knowing folks. And if folks like you and they like what you're doing and they see value in it, you ain't even got to apply for the grants. They will tell you, we just want you to fill out this one thing that tells us no who you are, what you do, and we gonna write you the check for a hundred thousand dollars. Very true. But that doesn't happen all the time. Yeah. That was work. That's work you have to put in establishing yourself. That could be five, six years in, right? That's right. That's but right. not many black-led, black-established nonprofits sometimes don't make it to that five, six-year mark to the point where that that can begin to happen. So it's a real reality check about are you doing this for the bag? Because if you are, you're not going to be there for five years. That's or true. are you really in it for the mission? Right. Because the mission will keep you going, knowing that eventually the money will come as long as you continue to, to work the values of the mission. And that okay. really was the learning curve. Now, I didn't walk into the chamber saying, oh, I want to get to the bag. I walked into building this chamber with Eric initially because I was looking for clients. I'm a financial advisor. And I'm saying to myself, it must be an Inglewood Chamber of Commerce because at the time I had about three or four millionaires who lived in Inglewood very discreetly. And what I said to myself, there must be more. Let me join the Chamber of Commerce so that I can click into them. That's the evolution of the Chamber of Commerce because I found out there wasn't one. I was like, okay, we got to build one. But I stayed on that path. So. Wow. Yes. Yeah, I remember those early days in the chamber. Something else I want to throw in about that, when, what really goes into it, you're going to have a lot of people who start the journey with you who they may disappear. Yes. You know, I remember, and I'm not naming names, obviously, but we had people early in the chamber that were like, yeah, we want to do this, and we're down for the mission. And they literally, Sue and Bridget, disappeared never heard from some of them ever again so my advice too would be kind of be prepared for that like that mission that felicia is talking about and that problem that bridget is referencing that you want to solve you do have to let that push you through when things get rough because they will inevitably get rough and to felicia's point too and you notice this in business in general yes if people like you it's helpful and also if you have a track record that you can point to because i would even say this 
and I want to get you all's opinion on this in business and not for profit. People could not even like you, but if you can point to something that you did that was successful, it helps you tremendously. Yeah. They might not even like you, but they cannot dispute what you have done. What do you think about that, Bridget? Well, um, I, I think that that point is very valid. I also wanted to just speak on something in general, what I've been hearing from Felicia, from yourself, from Stu, a lot of the obstacles that we're talking about in business, I'm sorry, in not-for-profits are the same that you would experience in business. Mm -hmm. So there, there's a philosophy out here that you shouldn't even be starting a business until you have a bucket of money. Um, so, you know, you, and, and there's a lot of people that don't take salaries for years in their business. I knew a guy that actually had a million dollar company, met the president of the United States when Obama was in office. He had a video gaming company. He had about three or four employees and he still worked at IHOP overnight. So he he's was disciplined. Not, he was disciplined. disciplined. Yes, he was not taking a salary. Hmm. And so some so whether you're in the not for profit um, space or the for profit space, a lot of those challenges are really the same. And a lot of businesses go under, you know, in the first couple of years, just like not for profit. So it's really about discipline is one thing, but it's also about staying on track, getting proper advice, not jumping into something that you have not properly researched. You don't have a coach or a um, consultant or somebody that is helping you through the process that's been there. Um, and the idea or the obstacle about people dropping out. That's another thing that you find in both for profits and not for profits. I have one client who has that exact model that we're talking about, where he started up a for profit business. Um, and then it's an agriculture, it's a um, farm to or a farm to table cafe. And so he brought me in to help him do a not-for-profit version of that where we started an education, an agriculture education program for kids. But in his actual business, he was experiencing the same problem, you know, turnover with employees, people that came into the business with him as investors or, you know, think tanks um, are no longer with them. So this is really, when you're a visionary, this is a somewhat of a part of the process that you're going to have to go through until you really build that solid team. And it's going to take some time, effort, and um, dedication. Indeed. Uh, I think that's a strong point. Um, I want to go back to some of the other things that people would need. So we know they need money. But Stu, what else would a person need? Like, I don't hear people talk about developing a board of directors. Yeah. I that's, think, one of the, that's probably one of the hardest activities, Bridges, you mentioned staying on track. Yeah. Do we believe that the board of directors would help you stay on track when things are getting rough? Well, well, I'm sorry. No, Bridget, I want to give you a chance, but mm -hmm. I also want to acknowledge there's a great question here in the audience uh, from Ada Babineau. And her second point is, the board seems to run a nonprofit business over the person who started the business. And I think that's right on really, time. You know, right so uh, and she has another point that there seems to be more stringent reporting as far as taxes and functioning. And I don't know if it's any more or less stringent than um, with a for profit. But Bridget, I, 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 please, uh, to your point about developing the board, er er Eric's question, please continue. Well, I, I believe a strong when you're thinking about a board, your board should not be micromanaging, but they should be resourceful and they should be, uh, and they should have your back. So um, I was- Bridget, Let me stop you for one second. I wanna hear the rest of that, but what I wanna first make sure we get to, because we got younger people watching, how do you get the board? I, we know that they need to have these characteristics, but how do you get them? Cause somebody's sitting there like, okay, I know I need a board, but what's the strategy to get these solid people that you were talking about? And let me, let me I'm wondering, and in addition to that, I think well, the one thing I want to help, you know, add to that is the, for me, from my perspective, I, I'm thinking that the board and Bridget, you can take it from here. I'm thinking that the board is to help that individual 
bring that vision to life. Right. So can you, okay, so how do you even get those people to Eric's question into? We got a lot of different questions happening out of here. So Well, no again, it start everyone starting from a different place. So sometimes people are starting from scratch and they don't have a lot of resources um, in terms of people, you know, human resources. And then you have other people that are in that world where they know a lot of people with money. They know a lot of people that are philanthropic. Of course, those type of people have an advantage. Okay. Um, but if you're start, I'm going to take it, I guess the most important question would be if you're just starting from scratch and you don't know anybody, you have to get out there and meet people. Um, and there's also, we're in the world of technology. You have volunteer match. You have a lot, you have indeed, you have a lot of, um, resources where you can actually solicit people that have the expertise that you're looking for that may want to volunteer their time. Um, as you're doing events and and networking and telling people about your programs you know see who is excited about doing uh you know about being involved with this type of initiative and you just begin recruiting that way and also know what expertise you're looking for you need to have a grid in writing that says i need a lawyer i need Good a, point. Good point. um you know i need a um accountant I need Great. somebody with a not-for-profit management background. I need okay. a couple of people who have started a not-for-profit. If it's in education, I need some teachers, some retired teachers on board. You know, so there is a lot of, you, you have to know exactly what you're looking for. And then that will guide you in terms of where you go to look for these individuals and how to spot them. But one okay. of the things that I will say, because there is a lot of people that are concerned, one, one of the major concerns I, I hear and I don't know how, and um, Eric, you're good at researching, so this will be a good <laughs> research project. Um, but I think a lot of people are overly concerned about the board taking over their, um, their organization. So one of the concerns that I hear a lot is, well, if I get a board and they vote me out, now I'm no longer part of the organization that I started. This is a fear that everyone has. Yes. But personally, I've never seen that happen. Not to say that it hasn't happened, but I've never seen it happen. That doesn't mean it doesn't happen. And um, like I said, Eric, you may want to research how often does that actually happen and should that be a real fear? And I'm going to okay. tell you why I don't think it's a fear because most people aren't down for really doing the type of work or the putting in the time and effort that it really takes to run an organization. So I would not... <laughs> Board members really are people that are busy doing what they do every day in their own career, but they have a kind of a, um, a concern about the problem that this organization is solving. And so they want to see that initiative happen, but they don't necessarily want to be hands on day to day, you know, doing that grind work. So I don't think it's as much of a fear as people think it is um well, i'm gonna speak to that i want to speak to that that's yeah. a good point first of all i can't really take that much credit for being a good researcher i think i'm good at hiring people who are good <laughs> so i'm not gonna try to take that credit um, <laughs> i'm a good recruiter i'm a great recruiter but let me say this people they will get rid of you now mm -hmm. they will get rid of you on your not-for-profit board when i first started my first not-for-profit that was talking about ladies alive uh with beulah mcloy the, the lady who was coaching us got voted out of her not for profit. And so she said, Eric and Beulah, you need to understand going, because this is what happens, Felicia, and you might have seen this. They're not going to vote you out when you're struggling and trying to get it together. They're going to vote you out once it gets the prestige and the funding comes in. That's when you're at risk for getting voted out, because now it's attached to my brand, Big Stu. We got this multi-million dollar not-for-profit. I'm on the board and I get to take all these pictures. That's when I feel and what I've seen, you're at risk for being voted out. Felicia, have you seen that? And are you worried about that? I haven't seen that, but that that's your um, comment about when it could happen is absolutely dead on. Um, I go back to Bridges point, when you're struggling, Nobody is interested in coming in and taking over your day-to-day -day operations. They don't have the capacity for that. But they also don't have the same passion for the mission 
that you have. They support the work and the growth of the organization. And so, yes, it can happen. But what I will say when we think about starting a nonprofit and developing that, that board, right? I, identifying who we want to be on that board. You're going to have probably about four to six turnovers before you get a board that's really on board to do the work of oversight. Because that's really what the board is designed to do. It's just mm-hmm. oversight. Sure, indeed. Are, no, are you no. make sure you're not stealing the money? Right. <laughs> right? Still responsible. Really. And we're moving forward with the mission. Yeah. I mean, that's really, and it's a, it's a lot of, so that first board are going to be people who support you. Yeah. And once they, re, as you move a little further, get a little further ahead, it's going to be more than they probably want to continue to do in terms of meetings and all of that, because there's so much happening. You want to share everything and you want to make sure that people know what's happening and you're going to have turnover. So I wouldn't put all your eggs in one basket on the first board. Of course, you want people that will support you. And it's really about helping you market this new organization. But I agree with Bridget and Eric is that you will have to get, as your organization grows, you got to get real strategic about who you need on your board to help you move the organization forward. You need an, an attorney that can help you guys look through legal documents, right? And, and establish some legal and um, groundwork to make sure that the work that you're doing and all of the people you have doing some of this contract work, that that remains confidential. You're going to need a CPA that's really given a second set of eyes to, I mean, we have a CPA on the board, but we also have an accountant and we need those mm. second set of eyes in case something is missed right? Sure. I'm not an accountant. I'm a financial advisor. So I need this person to do that work. And I go back to what Eric just said. I'm good at hiring and selecting the right people. I'm never trying to, I can't be the marketing person and the HR person and the accounting person and understand all of the legal ease that I need to be clear about. You will develop that over time. And so don't feel like, before I start my, I have to find an accountant and a CPA. You might not find out all of those people all at the same time. Maybe you get one or two, but know that it's it's a it's it's you know just like anything, it is absolutely not a sprint. It's a it's a slow targeted marathon, and you're gonna go through some turnover, not just with operations people, but absolutely with your board. So just prepare for that. Fantastic point. Stu, are you going to say something? Yeah, I wanted to. So all of exactly all of that. you said. I wanted to speak to I wanted to go back and speak to the turnover piece, because I think that's super important. I struggled with that in the beginning of my businesses. So the turnover is turnover. Remember, we're saying and I'm talking to the audience. We're saying that whether you're a non for prop nonprofit or for profit, it's the same. Right. You have the same mission, same purpose. You got to raise money. You're trying to solve a problem. problem. It's all the same. Right. And so I struggled with turnover in the beginning of my businesses, taking it very, very personal. Like it's something I'm doing wrong now. Right. It may have been some things I was doing wrong, but nevertheless, that turnover, that churn rate is really high in the beginning. You're just going to have it. Because you're still figuring out your own mission, your own continuity of it. And some people just, you got to be really, really structured. So I just want to encourage people in the beginning to don't be too discouraged about the level of turnover that you have. Some people come in for seasons and reasons, right? And they see what's required and what you're asking. Things may be going on in their lives and they just pull it up. So it's okay to have that turnover and then there's one more piece i want to make sure so i'm always talking to people who are at the very beginning of starting my audience is people who have an idea and are needing to get it out on paper to see if it becomes something Mm -hmm. what happens in these conversations that i generally have lots of trouble with is we we often talk in spaces of we're already Mm -hmm. on right and so we have to remember that we're talking to people who 
uh, a lot of us are talking to people who are considering, right? Who are thinking about, they have an idea and they don't know where or how. So when we talk about having this money, access to money, I just want to say, look, don't worry about the money in the beginning. Do what you have to do out of your own pocket first. Just do what you can first. Build something that is a proven concept first. And then you'll get, when you're to Felicia's point, six, seven years in, five, six, then you'll start to be able to uh, attach and bring these other people on and you'll see your capacity grow. Six, two, dropping them jewels. Yeah. If you are turn, just tuning in, this is the Money Sex Gen X podcast. Me and Big Sue have made it to season five, Felicia and Bridget. This is episode five. Should you start a not for profit? And that title is very strategic, you all, because it's like Sue said, it's a lot of people out there with ideas. We're trying to give some guidance if it's a good fit for you individually. Because guess what? We talked about this. You can do other things. Like somebody else might have a not-for-profit, Felicia. You can serve on their board. You can contribute money to their 501c3 Bridget. You don't necessarily have to be the one who starts it, uh, but you can still contribute. So we, we were trying to have this conversation. Now, Bridget, I want to go back to you real quick because I want to start talking about some mistakes that I've made. Um, you and I started the Giving Tree Educational Consultant years ago we made every mistake possible for me. <laughs> Stu, we made every mistake possible we, we actually let it it, it it kind of destroyed our relationship you know in many ways because it was just a lot so what, was what, some, what advice, were some of the mistakes you all made we about to get into it we about to get into it so um, what advice would you give people, Bridget? And I hope you're okay with talking about this. I'm not mm -hmm. trying to put you on the spot, but this is meant to be helpful. You for, might remember for, more about it than me. <laughs> okay. Bridget, well, Bridget I, suppressed well, what, I remember, Bridget I suppressed what I remember is not so great, but I'm going to try to keep it, you know. But if two, if two people have some kind of a relationship, whether it be romantic, friends, or whatever, what advice would you give them? if they're starting something together? What have you learned about starting stuff with people you have close relationships with? Oh, and particularly a not-for-profit. Yeah, you. Well, what, you, I, what advice would you give? That's a, it's a, that's a tough one because I'm always even personally torn with that because I believe in family businesses and I, like ideally, I want people to be able to employ their family, bring their family on. Like, this is what we're doing this for. This is what I, that's what motivates me to, to start any business or a not-for-profit. I try to leave, I want to leave a legacy for my family. I want to be able to bring people into the, the organization or the company that I'm running so that it can benefit not just me, but my family. But then you have that flip side of you're working with your family <laughs> or you're working with your partner. So if I if I was to give advice on that, I would say stay in your lane. And if you know your partner is an expert in a particular area, let them handle that particular area. Don't. Um, and if you're the expert, you know, hopefully your partner will respect your expertise. So just like you would go into any if you were employed by a company and you had a particular job to do. You don't go around telling everybody else how to how to do their job. You know, you respect people's positions. And so I would say that that's the first thing that kind of comes to my mind is really to. And I think that that did kind of come into play even with the, our um, organization and, you know, just making sure that you allow people to do their job without interfering so much and let them be the expert in what they're supposed to be doing. OK, that's a very PC way of delivering the message i appreciate that <laughs> um i would say to bridget felicia i would not suggest that you start a not-for-profit with someone you have a close relationship with felicia now felicia and i because i just think it's too high risk and there's so much at stake that you're just adding more risk now when felicia and i started the chamber i was just coming off of an experience too where i helped to co-found the greater inglewood cdc 
And I'm going to be PC, but I acted a fool and so did all of the other people. I'll just say that. We got it done. A lot of talented people, but we acted a fool. And I'm sure if you talk to any of those people one-on-one, -on -one, they would tell you that a lot of us are not cool now. But the organization is still standing and doing its thing. Wait, wait, now, wait, wait, wait. You, you, you being too, you still being, look, give me some, give me some, give me some tea, man. Give me, give me some tea. <laughs> what, what does acting a fool look like? And starting to see, That's give me some question. examples, man. That's give me question. what's acting a fool look like. Acting a fool looks like letting your ego. You still giving me the collegiate? You still giving me the collegiate answer? I can't. I can't. Let me see. How can I say this? Because I don't want to. Was y'all was y'all challenging each other? Was there arguments? Were there? Yeah, we were there arguments we were, in meetings. Like you ain't you ain't shit. You you don't know what you well, talking it about. It, it was stuff that like far. that. It didn't go that far. I remember one of the board members yelling down the street after me one time, and, and <laughs> yeah. I remember somebody a male starting to cry it wasn't me but somebody started. so yeah it was a lot of which was shocking which was shocking at the time but yeah we were we were arguing i mean we were trying our best felicia to be professional but everybody was just so passionate about getting it done they they were residents of inglewood and so they were kind of looking at me like okay we know you know this stuff but you're not from inglewood you know what I mean? So it was a little bit of that going on. My whole thing was, I know what I'm talking about. We're going to get this done. And we did get it done. And, and not just because of me, because of a collective effort, totally. But yes, we were arguing. We were splitting off into groups, venting about the other people. We were being very unprofessional in board meetings at times. Um, we were starting other organizations off to the side just to make sure to leverage if something happens here. It was a lot of different things going on. But to our credit, I will say that we pulled together enough to accomplish the goal, which was to bring Inglewood another organization that focused on economic development. We did, we did that. We pulled together enough to do that. Me personally, I do believe I was arrogant and I didn't want to be questioned. And my approach just wasn't people centric too. Wow. you know what i mean it wasn't like caring people if you're leading a group of people yes you can get things done that's what i've learned but you need to create a nurturing environment Come on. an environment where, where everyone feels like they're heard and you're not suggesting that you're the only one who knows what's going on because it's never the case now by the time i got to felicia i had had some years to kind of sit with myself and learn that I needed to improve my leadership. So Felicia got a much better version of Eric. And me and Felicia really didn't, I don't remember having not one problem with Felicia. Felicia, did I, was I acting crazy? I don't, I don't. <laughs> no, so. no, not at all. I think, I think to this day, I think we have a really solid relationship. And even after, you know, um, Eric moved on from our board, you know, I still checked in with him and gave him some updates on where the organization was because regardless, he's a founder. He's a founder of this work. And this is still going to be in his legacy books as an organization that he helped start. Definitely. So I think it's just good for him to know where we are, what we're doing, how we're elevating. But also, I, you know, I talk about challenges, right? Um want to go back to what he said about, you know, learning to be people centric. And that's not just in the organization, but that's in the community in which you're being a nonprofit. Right. Yeah. So I know I'm, I'm steering a little bit to the curve, no, but please, 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 please. also understanding that I walked into this nonprofit space with no nonprofit experience and didn't realize how much politics was involved. Right. Blindsided me. I'm yeah. thinking that I'm just doing good work and I'm trying to, you know, be very helpful. But I didn't realize I was stepping on toes like yeah. because it wasn't in my peer, peer view. Right? right. I didn't right. know that, you know, who I should be talking to and what relationships I was building. That was with the help and this, and I will have to say this, Perry Gunn 
who was then the executive director of Teamwork Inglewood, lots of guidance, lots of conversations yeah. about, okay, what should I be doing and what should I be saying and who should I be talking to? Because that stuff didn't, when you are, you come from a for-profit space, we already know bottom line is results. Did you get the money? Did you generate the revenue? Did you make the number of calls you said you were going to make? And so that was what my focus was. Did I talk to how many businesses did I talk to business owners? Did I talk to a week? How many times did I go out into the community? Like that was what I had given myself as achievement markers. Right. These were what I was thinking my KPIs were. And I didn't realize that I needed to factor in community partners, elected oh, officials. Yeah. Congressman, everybody, city of Chicago, that I should have been building relationships with because that was huge value. But let me go back to the stepping on toes. I didn't realize that even in the midst of doing good work, people saw the work as a threat to what they were doing. That now completely that's blindsided me because <laughs> I didn't realize that anything in nonprofit could be a threat to anybody, but it yeah. was. And I had to wow. figure out how to navigate that experience Absolutely. and my feelings about it. Absolutely. I'm glad you brought that up, Felicia. Have you seen that, too? That's something I wanted to talk about. No, I can't say that I've seen that. Um and I wonder if it's really about the nonprofit or just the simple fact that the way we hate on each other sometimes, even as adults, I'm just, just even though, you know, we see somebody doing something, and, you know, because we're not doing, you know, we do, you y'all do know we hate on each other as adults. Oh yeah, yeah, y'all do. We, we get jealous of time. each other. We yeah. get jealous. Um, so I haven't really seen it. Um, so yeah. But well, we I want to get. I want to say this, I, I, and I'm glad you brought that up, Felicia, because. One day I'm going to write a book about my experiences with not-for-profits. I'm going to write a short little book. But one of the chapters is going to definitely talk about letting all of these side things get in the way of serving the people. I used to sit in these board meetings for all different types of organizations, and I'm hearing about everybody, Bridget, but the person that we're supposed to be serving. Mm -hmm. So we have an organization about kids, but nobody's mentioning any kids. Right. We have an organization about economic development, but we're not talking about anybody developing economically, Stu. And I, I really had a problem with that. I was guilty of it, too. But I feel like it happens far too often because we let our brand and our ego get in the way of, the, Felicia, the mission. Why am I really here? Our mission was really clear. We need to get these businesses in Inglewood support. She says, how did you navigate that? Wow, that, that could be a whole show. I would say you have to definitely block out the noise. Block out the noise and keep your inner circle kind of tight. And this is cliche, but I do think it worked for me. It's like you got to block out the noise. And in every board meeting, Felicia, and correct me if I'm wrong, we did this in the chamber and the CDC. Before every board meeting, we would read the mission statement. It was actually on the agenda. That's big. That's big. So That's that everybody, before we even start talking, you can remember why we're supposed to be doing what we're doing. And I think that was one of the biggest strategies that helped. Uh, Bridget, how would you say a person can navigate all of this uh, kind of losing sight because people are hating and they feel like you're stepping on their toes? Or in my case, hey, you don't even live here. What you know about Inglewood? Well, I'm going to throw a word out there that I think we need to remember, and that's the word humble. I think when you're doing, a, when you are involved in a not-for-profit, you have to be humble, especially if you're the founder, um, because when you, you have to understand that when you become a not-for-profit, you are actually, you're, you're not a business in the sense that you own it it's really owned by the public. It's for the benefit of the public and it is it is a public entity. And so um, you have to start using terms like we, not I. You know, what, one of the mistakes that I know I personally have experienced with some of my clients is that I have to kind of retrain them to say, you know, there I did this and I did that and I'm gonna do this and it's no longer I, 
it's we, you know, you're a not-for-profit organization and it's we, meaning you, the board, the community, you know, what are we going to do? And so when you're walk, if you're saying things like I, this and I, that, it can actually spark some feelings among the other team members that you're, you know, involved with. And if they're actually putting in work, it might not be as much work as you, but they're, they're putting in work and they're contributing. They want to hear you um, say things and honor them, you know, through your language and how you're describing the organization. And so that's one transition that you have to make when you're going from maybe working as an uh, entrepreneur in a for-profit arena and delving into not-for-profit, it is no longer I this and I that, and that's not really respected in the not-for-profit world as it is in the for-profit world. You know, it is Very really cool. about the mis mission. Um, you don't want your face on every periodical. You know, it's not about you. It's the people that you're helping. The people that you're helping, their face needs to be on, on there. The community, you know, your efforts, your initiatives, um, the results of those initiatives, the volunteers, that's another mm -hmm. great people, yeah. to, um, the, the volunteers being on your periodicals, not your face as the founder. And so, uh, and I've actually seen that be an issue in some people's organizations where they feel like the person is trying to make this about them and it causes a reaction. So you have to be humble. If you really want to build a team, it's about your team. It's about the community. Take yourself out of it. And I think people will respect you a lot more. Beautiful point. Um, Beautiful. And I did oh, want to make one, one more point, too, about the um, um, preventing yourself from being kind of ousted. One way that you can, one actual, um, something that you can put into um effect in order to prevent that from happening is to create is to create your bylaws in a way that you have um because you're the, as a founder you set the tone you set the rules in the beginning so any board member coming into your organization they have to abide by the rules you set when you founded the organization so bridget so, are you saying are you saying i can write into my bylaws that i can't be voted out of this I don't think you can do that, but what you can do is you can set term limits for your board so that they don't become too big. And so what you can do is say, you know, you can, after a year, you have to be re-voted in, or you can, just like the president of the United States, they can only serve two terms, right? So, and then they can't serve anymore. They can um, be an advisor, they can still be involved, but they cannot actually be a decision making person on your board. I like so, I like that. I like yeah. that concept of you possibly being voted off of your board of a nonprofit. I actually because it kind of I helps, do too, actually. I actually kind of like that. Um I like and I think that if, if founders embrace that, it also would help them remain humble. That you know exactly. what? If I if I get off task. You know, they could vote me out. This, I'm, this yeah. is about the mission. This ain't about me. So you need the best. You need the best leader in position. I'm going through that in my own private business right now. Well, I recognize that I may not be the best CEO. Wow. I need to find another CEO. So yeah. I do not. I'm not. I'm not against um, founders of companies. Mm -hmm. Companies. I'm not against founders of companies being voted out. Me either. I'm I not against. That's I powerful. It is, it, it's a yeah. It's a gut check to be voted out. I can imagine it's it's painful. Like damn it, I started this thing and they voted me out. But <laughs> I think that makes it better, right? No question. We have I another agree. question in the uh, audience. Okay. After Absolutely. how many years should you be concerned about not turning over a profit for your nonprofit, especially since you don't want your passion to be a hobby? You want it to be a thriving business. And so the first thing that came to my mind when I saw it is maybe you need to be running a for-profit business. Yeah, because it's really not about turning a profit, but it's about how are you generating enough revenue to continue to grow and expand the nonprofit operations, right? And so an example of that, so let me, and I'll try to make this as quick as possible. When we were starting the Chamber of Commerce, in the very beginning, Eric and I was really clear that this should have been an arm of the CDC. 
Absolutely. This should not have been a separate organization. Absolutely. We knew that the Community Development Corporation was focused on economic development, right? And they were going to get in that real estate arm. And what we said was, great, let us build the chamber so that we can really connect to the existing businesses but me also thinking the existing commercial property owners, right? Let's right. make sure that we're tapping into all of the people who are already out here doing something so that they can feel like they have a voice in things that are going to be happening in Inglewood and that they're participating and that they have, you know, information that's coming, you know, that the CDC was getting from the state, from the county, from the city that we can say, okay, as members, you're going to get this information right away. We're going to make sure that you have all the tools to be really successful. And we were really adamant. This should not be two separate entities, but they were not interested. First, they were interested. Then they weren't interested. And then once we moved forward, I mean, when I say interested, they didn't even want to have a conversation, like an official conversation. We're saying we're going to do all the work, help us with a little bit of funding. And then once we get it going, we gonna peace out because this is like this. We just want to help get it popping, right? Right, right. He's so we end up having to start the chamber on our own, which is fine. But with any growing business or organization, it's really about. It's just me. I'm marketing. I'm outreach. I'm doing it. Now it's about generating enough income from grants, from whatever, so that I can hire more people to reach more people. I was working full time and still mm -hmm. doing the chamber. So this was not my full time focus, but I was still very passionate about it. So it wasn't about, I'm trying to have a lot of money in the coffers, which is helpful, but it's helpful for continuing programming, hiring people and actually giving them a salary because ain't nobody gonna work free, just me them first five right. years, right? So right. every step of the way, right? We have two new employees, we have ADP, we have an accountant, you know, we have auditors, like we are slowly getting there. And each year it's about how do I get more money to do the next thing? And the next thing for us is healthcare. The next thing for yeah. us is more people. So now I need, we have one program manager, now we need a program director. Now we need a dedicated marketing person. Now we need this. So it's really about, are you actually growing the team to do the broader, more intricate part of the work? Because you, as one person, you can only reach so many people. Exactly. And I want to, we're kind of, uh, our time is going a lot faster than I thought it was. I knew this was going to be an intriguing conversation. I want to give you all a chance to make some final thoughts, and I, but I want to make a quick point first. To your point, Felicia, about those people, those individuals not being willing to basically partner or consolidate, that's one of those things I would say to people, you kind of have to, you kind of have to maintain your focus on the bigger picture because that was disappointing. But that's an example of where politics got, had more of a hand in the mission of the community, of serving the community. That's a perfect example. And, it, and at the time, it's like, this doesn't even make sense. Like, why? But it, if we were to talk to a lot of these people now who probably aren't even part of any of this stuff, they probably would agree. Like, wow, that was short-sighted. I was caught up at the time. You know, maybe I'm pretty sure a lot of, I've talked to some of them. I'm sure they've grown from that, but it made absolutely no sense. All right, we're rounding home base, ladies. Thank you for coming on the show. I want to give you, and this, if you're tuning in late, Season five, Money, Sex, Gen X, episode five. Money, Sex, Gen X is really about giving Gen Xers an opportunity to talk about their lives, things that they're passionate about, and to give some game to the younger generation. Stu and I started this podcast because we felt like there weren't enough Felicia's, Bridget's, Stu's, and Eric's in the media. This show is consumed globally, especially the audio part. So people are taking this audio. Stu hooks up the audio after the show. It gets sent out to all the major platforms. People are consuming this because they're looking for these types of conversations. So again, I want to thank you. We're going to honor you by 
promoting your different companies, promoting your bio on our website and all that, because we feel like it's extremely important. But take us out with your final thoughts about should you start a not-for-profit? Based on Bridget's comment, the, the title of this show should have probably been, should we start a not-for-profit and taking the you out, right? Ooh, nice. That was nice. Yes. But that Bridget, was- take us out. Take us out on this conversation about not-for-profit. What are your final thoughts? I think that there's value in starting a not-for-profit. There's also value in starting a business. And we're in a age where actually the hybrid of both actually makes sense. Uh, Most corporations, if you go on their website, they have some type of giving component, some type of foundation um, that shows that they're not just about making money, but give, but also about giving back to the community. So I think that it's not really a matter of either, or it's just which one is best for you and how you can possibly even incorporate both. Okay, beautiful. Remember, Bridget is the founder and owner of 501c3 My Org. If you have a vision of starting a not-for-profit organization, I can tell you from experience, you definitely need to connect with Bridget. She has a process for you to follow to to go from idea, like Stu was talking about, idea to an actual organization. She's going to help you get all your legal stuff done, all of that, training, whatever you need. Bridget Scarborough, 501c3 My Org. Bridget, where can people get in contact with you? Um, they can, the best, the absolute best thing is to just call 830-320-1264. That's 830-320-1264. All right, hit Bridget up. Felicia Slayton Young, thank you for coming on. Miss Financial Advisor Extraordinaire and Economic Developer. What do you have to say, final thoughts on this not-for-profit conversation? I would say, and it's the thing that stays with me, is one, as Eric mentioned, read the mission. The goal is to prevent mission creep. Make sure that you stay on task. That has helped me to stay in my lane, the chamber's lane. We're focused on what we are trying to accomplish and not what anybody else is doing. And I think that's been really the formula to our growth is being clear about what we came here to accomplish and all of the steps that helps us accomplish that. Do that and you will absolutely see um, the, the fruits of your labor. Okay, no doubt. All right. Thank you for that. Now, where can people, so we got people that's like, oh, I didn't know she was a financial advisor. So where can they get in touch for you for that? And then where can they get in touch with you as far as the change? Sure. You can definitely, uh, for Bell Luker, visit my website, www.belluker.com. You can get on there, learn a little bit about who I am, what I do and schedule a call. Um, for anything small business related, uh, support, um, growth, or, or just a conversation, definitely seek me out at fyoung at gechamber.com or definitely visit our website to learn more about what we're doing and how we're doing it, www.gechamber.com. All right. I wanted to talk about the foundation, but we ran out of time. But go to the GE Chamber website. You can find some information about that. Quickly, Felicia, can you tell people about your background back there? What are those images that you have in your backdrop? Wow, these images, uh, and you don't have the full scheme. It's just really photos over the years of all of the things that we've done. That first picture that you see is our very first fundraiser that we had. That second picture that. Uh, below that. is one of the barbers, a SUNY Pals Barbershop, Pals Barbershop. We've had a lot of different events over the summer, me talking to business owners um, and you know other events that we've done, uh, we, we did a little, um, what we call the GE Chamber Marketplace out in the courtyard. So we've done a lot of good okay. stuff. And this was okay. a great way to kind of capture it. The business plan, comp- Inglewood business plan competition, definitely if no you're a small doubt. business no owner, yes. you're trying to get yes. some capital. Yes. Yes. They're giving away anywhere from $10,000 to $25,000 every year. So make sure real. Real. you don't talk of that, right? 
So Real. yeah, you always trying to get do good Love work. That. Love working with all of the organizations in Inglewood that support all of the work that we're doing in our growth and most importantly appreciating the partnerships and the love we're building amongst the other nonprofit organizations in Inglewood. Absolutely, no doubt. Love both of you ladies. Thank you for coming on. We will definitely continue to work together and stay in touch. Talk to you soon. Wow, what a great episode, Stu. Can't hear you, brother. Uh-oh, my bad. What a great episode. What a great episode. I think I cut Bridget. Are you still there? I think I cut you off. Uh, you were. I think I cut you off in the middle of you saying thank you on your way out. Oh so yeah, I just said thank you, and there I'll you be go. looking forward to getting my mug. Oh okay. okay. All right, right. No, that's, <laughs> what's up. that's what's up. Thank you, thank you, Bridget. Right. Bye bye. All right. Thank you, Ada right. Babino, for your comments and engaging us yes, today. We thank you, thank that. you, Ada. Very oh, good feedback and, and questions. So, Stu, we got a couple of quick things to run through. Yeah, let's get to I don't it. know if we have enough time, but we're going to do it anyway. All right. So we usually do something called characters from corporate. Um, it's basically people giving their feedback about their experiences in corporate. This one's going to be short. It's kind of running out of time. Uh, we had somebody write in from Atlanta, Georgia. Stu, they work at a marketing agency. They are in a situation where they are working virtual and they feel like because of their skin color, they are being targeted. This is a black female from Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, she says she's a millennial being targeted for not working hard enough in a virtual environment, um, kind of being prodded to go back into the office does not want to do that because of COVID. And she basically wants our feedback on, does she, do we think she's being overly sensitive about people trying to make it look like she's not working hard enough and should she just kind of stay the course or find another corporate situation? Characters from corporate. What do you think? Well, off the bat, I don't think she's being overly sensitive about it. I think it's, it's, a, real, it's a real question to ask. Uh, I wouldn't want to go back into the office. Uh, I have become accustomed to working from home myself. So that that's I'm biased in that because, you know, I get it. So, no, the answer, I don't think she's I don't think you're being a character from corporate. But okay. think hard, long and hard about what it is that you're doing and where you want to go with your career and your business. Can you find something else if you and I just read an article where uh, a company was pressuring their staff to come back in like 90 percent of the staff quit quit 90 no percent i mean and it, this company has like 300 employees sure imagine yeah. that no um doubt. and they, they were saying look we didn't need to be in the office we don't need to be in the office we're good our revenue is up since working from home productivity is up no we don't want to come back and we're not coming back so no i don't think she's being a core uh, character what about you well, you know, like we usually what happens in these, I usually agree with you 1000%. Today is no different. I have, I don't disagree at all. Yeah. Think about what you want to do. I'm sure a lot of people, not that this really helps, I'm sure a lot of people are going through that. Um, even though, you know, most times you might feel more sensitive about it than it really is. Probably a lot of people are being scrutinized that are working in a virtual environment. But sometimes as, pe sometimes as people of color, we, you know, we take it a little bit harder. So just maybe talk to other people and see what they're experiencing. Other people who are not black and see, you know, are they being scrutinized and try to get a sense of the whole picture before making a decision. So, yeah, it's a great character from corporate. Virtual doesn't want to go back into the office. Yeah. Okay. All right, Big Stu, do we have a pool artist for today? We do not have a pool artist for today, but I do want to acknowledge that uh, our URL has changed. Okay. So I just want to put that up on the screen that if you want to check out some great new music, check out poolofmusic.com. A great of pool of great talent music from all different genres, podcasters on there, music producers. Even there are a couple of audio books on there. Go okay. to poolofmusic.com. 
Bet.com. They are our sponsor, one of our sponsors today. The other sponsors, Hubris Global Wealth Management. Where can they find mm-hmm. Hubris? Where can they find Hubris? Uh, I almost did the www thing, but I'm I'm showing my age. Hubriswealth.us. H U E R I S Wealth dot U S. Hubriswealth.us. Check them out. Hubriswealth.us. Check them out if you want to get your finances in order. I call the founder and the CEO of Hubris Wealth Wealth. I call him the financial whisperer. Like this guy <laughs> is the financial therapist. He is wow. a financial therapist. He is the money whisperer. So okay, um, I used to feel uncomfortable when you said that financial no, 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 therapist, no, no. but I'm kind of leaning into that yeah, a man. little bit. All I right? think I think so. I think I think you should. Okay. I appreciate um, that. In the world where everybody's branding themselves differently and newly, uh, the financial therapist. You don't need a certificate to be that, right? Um, it's just a moniker, you know, so okay. I like calling you that because you helped me personally through a, a bunch of things and I'm able to still stand on some of those principles today. Thank you. Okay. And thank you. Hubriswealth.us. Hubris Wealth, our other sponsor for today. So that's all I got there. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. All right. I do want to I do have one more segment. E-Money's Wardrobe Spotlight. Okay, okay. For you all who've been following us from uh season one, first of all, you know, e money is clearly the the wardrobe, the fashionista here. He's rocking. I want to shout out the brim. Okay. I want to shout okay. out the brim. Thank you, I sir. Thank you. It's, I don't think I've seen that brim before. You know what, brother? You actually have seen it, but I, I, have. Re- I remixed it so it looks a little bit interesting. Different. Yeah, and I yeah. love how I, I got hit, tired of wearing baseball caps. So. I love how it hits off the leather jacket. I see you with the leather jacket with the thank frontal you, zips, you. and I see you with the classic low, low sweater with the yes, flag. Sir. Yes, sir. Yes, so, sir. I appreciate it. E money, you be coming with it, man. E money's e money. Thank you, sir. Spotlight, but I will say this, man. I always appreciate that spotlight. But if you see me throughout the week, I'll be looking crazy. <laughs> Throw on you might see me down and walking down the street with some gray sweatpants on, looking crazy, hair not combed, and all that. So this is an opportunity for me to wear some of these these garments that we've accumulated over the years. You know that they're not just sitting in the closet because we're in that virtual environment yeah, so much now. Yeah, yeah. New so I appreciate you. That I'm I'm short on. I haven't bought any new pants in so long. In two years, I don't think I bought a new pair of pants. Mm. Uh, you know, that's a whole nother conversation. But at any rate, at any rate, you fly today, E Money, as you do. And guess what? Big Stu is fly in person. Every time I see him, we, we met up at a buddy's house last week. He came through with the drip always. There's always something unique that he has on. Last week, it was the slide. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm like, wow. And I had my slides in the car. I'm like, man, I should have brought my slides up. But, you know. He held it down, so <laughs> I get inspiration from those I'm around. Like, yourself. hey, there you go. Great time last week at the homie's house, man. No doubt, no great doubt. time. That's what a awesome. great episode, yeah. man! Yeah, so we got very informative. More, right? Yeah, we got two more to finish out this season. So next week, I think we're doing. Should you go to church? That's gonna be on fire too. What's our guest name for that episode? Stephen J. Thurston the Third. Stephen J. Thurston III. Now, he's, a know, he, a, he's a pastor. He's a he's a he's a pastor, son of a pastor, and he I believe he's also has his his uh what is it I don't know he's indoctrinated to also pastor, but everybody on the South Side, the older generation for sure knows his pops. Okay, Stephen J. Thurston the second. Everybody Stephen knows J. Stephen J. Thurston, okay. Pastor Pastor right. Thurston. But not a lot of people. A lot of people do know Stephen Thurston the Third, but I don't know if they know him like like I know him and like you about to know him. Okay, he's yeah, very he's a Gen very Xer? interesting. Hmm? He's a Gen Xer. He is a Gen Xer. 
Okay, good. He I can't is wait. He's a Gen man. Xer. Yes. Okay. Money, sex, Gen X. Let's, yeah, let's meet him. Let's meet him. All right. Yeah, it's going to be fun. And then our last episode, I don't know if I'm getting the title right, but it's about colorism. Yeah, well, what is colorism? I think I what think is it's colorism? Like, what is, is colorism? It? Okay, we're going to get into the, the light skin, dark skin, and all of that. And Are you dark skin? What does that look like today? You know what? I consider myself dark skin, but I've been told, I keep being told that I'm, by, it, that's what I've learned is it depends. I don't, I consider myself dark skin, but it depends on who I talk to in terms of their perspective. I, I don't really look in the mirror and that's my first thought. Am I light skin? Am I dark skin? That's just not how my mind works. But yeah. I've had that conversation with people. Um, are you, would you consider yourself light, dark? I consider myself dark. I mean, I'm, okay. I'm, I'm dark, but I've, I've seen people darker. You know, but yeah. I'm dark. I embrace my dark skin. I feel like I'm a caramel. You know, I don't know what the people would say, but I'm dark. Okay. Yeah. Well, I guess part of that episode is going to be, does it matter? It's going to be interesting. It matters. Because we, we got, a, get we got a, a white guy joining us on that episode, too. We got a white guy, and we got someone who's definitely a different, a black person who's a different complexion than we are. Light skin. So we're going to have a couple of different, she's yeah. definitely lighter complexion. So we're going to have a couple of different perspectives. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So so looking forward to that. All right. All right, Stu. Well, let's get out of here, man. Uh, been a great episode. Let's keep rocking out, giving this life game up to the people. You already know what it is. Until next time.